Genesis 11, <clears throat> in the first nine verses. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Then they said one to another, Come, let us make brick and bake them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the towers which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore the name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the languages of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad across the face of the whole earth. In 1834, a novelist named Edward Bulwer Lytton wrote a novel called The Last Days of Pompeii. It was inspired by an 1830 painting by a Russian artist depicting the horrors of the people of Pompeii and Herculaneum as in 79 AD the Vesuvius erupted and engulfed both cities and destroyed all life in those cities. The purpose of the book was to contrast the decadent lifestyle of the residents of the city with the less decadent lifestyle of the earlier generations who had lived there and also uh, with the purity of the Greek and Roman eras which had come before and even the Egyptian era which had come before. I must say that given what discoveries we've made since the book was written, uh, I don't think that flies anymore, but uh, it was okay for Bulwer Lytton at the time. Nevertheless, the painting caused a sensation. If you get a chance to see it, uh, you can go and look for it on the net. There's, you can see a picture of it on the net. It's a pretty terrifying painting. And the book itself was a sensation <clears throat> and caused tremendous interest at the time that it was written. It spawned five operatic adaptions and it spawned nine film adaptions, the most recent of which was as recent as 1984. Obviously the concept and the story uh, has good legs. It continues to be relevant. It continues to be thought-provoking. But Bulwer Lytton was really trying to make a point about his own times and the perceived purity of earlier times than his times. Things are not as good now as what they were then. Maybe we are in the last days of the Victorian era, was what Bulwer Lytton was trying to say. He was suggesting that unless the people of his day didn't change their ways, judgment or disaster might come upon them too, as it had come upon the people in Pompeii and Herculaneum. How well he succeeded, we may never know. As with many lessons, it's certain that people listened but it's also likely that many people didn't learn anything from this book. Now we began this series with consideration of the phrase, the last days itself, the phrase itself, and how, without reference to what the phrase really means, modern Christian thought in many areas has redefined it to mean the whole of the time between Pentecost and the Lord's return. This interpretation is a classic case, in my opinion, of putting something into the scripture so you can get it back out again. It has no support in the Bible, Nevertheless, it hasn't stopped people from resting the phrase to suit their purposes and saying that the Bible can be used to support it. I hope that after two messages dealing with this in what I think is an error, if not before, you are convinced indeed that it is an error. In its standalone terms, though, the wording, the last days, has its simple understanding in the terms in which the Russian artist and Bulwer Lytton intended it to be interpreted, the end of an era the coming to a close of a particular period of time brought about by something and some occurrence that happened. In biblical usage, it is always prophetic, if not apocalyptic, those words, the last days. It's not a general term for all sorts of days. 
It's a specific term that has prophetical import and apocalyptic import. So this morning, let's cast the net wider than the New Testament in terms of the actual words, the last days, and see if the Bible talks about last days or latter days or days to come or the like, and see if the context of these statements builds up a good prophetical picture which we can be used to interpret the days that we are in today. So let's go back as we always should to Genesis. In the first five chapters of Genesis, we have the documentation of the first 1500 years of the world's and man's history. From creation to Noah. In this period of time, God created the universe and the earth and Adam and Eve. They sinned. They had two sons, Cain and Abel. Cain killed Abel and God gave Adam and Eve another son who they named Seth. Chapter 5 gives us the genealogy of man that occurred in that period, ending with the man named Noah. Chapter 6 begins with ominous words concerning the morality and spiritual state of man. We read in 6.1, it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men that they were beautiful and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. Now we've dealt with the contentious sons of God passage before. I don't intend to revisit it at the moment. Except to say that the plain reading of the passage clearly indicates that God was not pleased with this eventuality. That God was not pleased with this happening. Furthermore, God is not pleased with the progress, so to speak, of mankind in general. We read in verse 6, verse 3 of chapter 6, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his day shall be 120 years. Clearly, at this stage, God has had enough with man. And he sets a timeline for something to happen. He has 120 years left before something happens. Now, brethren, if, not, if, that's not, if those 120 years aren't the last days of that era, then what possibly could qualify as being last days in a proper understanding? Here we see the first indication in Scripture of the fact that although God is both eternal and timeless, he accommodates himself to earth and human timing in his dealing with the human race. 120 years is nothing to God, but here he sets a sunset clause on man's continuation. The amount of time is all that man has left before God will act. And that amount of time is not heavenly time or stretchable time or, you know, one day of creation is a thousand years. Really, you should understand it like that. Well, no, you shouldn't. This is 120 earth years, God says. 120 years, something's going to happen. The rest of the story we know. <clears throat> After 120 years, during this time, Noah and his sons built the ark and God gathered the animals together. God sends the flood and all humanity apart from Noah and his sons and their respective wives perish. All air-breathing animals, except those in the ark, perish. All trees and crops and plants are uprooted and scattered. And critically for our understanding of the pre-flood world, all human endeavor of every sort is also destroyed. Buildings, technology of any sort, objects and places of worship, if there were any, are all wiped out. Now, quick note here, it doesn't say that Noah took 120 years to build the ark. It just says that there was 120 years from when God says, these are the last days, to when the last day actually happened, and Noah and his family went into the ark. But whatever wording you might choose to describe those 120, word, 120 years, they were, in fact, the last days of the pre-flood world. All those other things that happened for 1,500 years, but these, this 120 years, these are the last days before God acts and does something. Man began perfect. He had sinned and separated himself from God and over 1,500 years had degraded spiritually and morally to a point where God find it necessary to wipe the slate and start again. So the pattern here is very well clearly set in Scripture. The pattern is decline from good places to bad places and decline to destruction. By definition, the decline is at its worst as the destruction comes closer in the last days. And this pattern is observed without fail throughout the rest of the Bible. Throughout the rest of the Bible. We see it again in the years after the flood. 
Noah and his family are released from the ark. How long was he in the ark? A year, a year and a month. Before he finally left the ark, a year and a month. And God announces a new beginning. Noah restarts the human race with an act of worship. And God responds with a promise. 8.20 in Genesis. If you can quickly get there in the Bible, I'm going to go to a lot of Bible references this morning. If you want to go through them with me, uh, you'll need nimble fingers. When Noah built an altar to the Lord, he took every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelt a soothing aroma. And the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake. Although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing that I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. So this is God's response to Noah offering an offering, a thanksgiving offering, obviously, for his preservation and that of his family, and for the opportunity to restart with a new beginning for the earth as God has virtually wiped it clean. Nothing more like what has already happened will happen again to the earth. The created order will continue. God promises this. And God acknowledges the fact that although he has saved Noah, Noah is still a sinner. We don't know the basis of the history of this act of sacrifice by Noah. We're still a thousand years here before the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. But clearly already we see a pattern that people offer sacrifices to the Lord. Now, I don't know where they got those ideas from. But here, clearly, God is pleased with the sacrifice. God is pleased with the offering. God is pleased with Noah thanking him by way of this offering for his deliverance. And so God is pleased with this. So a tradition of worship must have grown up without a specific set of commands from God. Nevertheless, God is clearly pleased and accepts this worship. So the post-flood era begins on a high. All that's been done. Let's start again. Let's start from the bottom of the valley. Let's go up to the top of the hill and let's start again. <coughs> and for a moment, it gets even higher. <clears throat> After issuing new commands regarding man's diet, 9.3 in Genesis, every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs. That's not particularly pleasing to vegans these days, I must say, but that's what God said you know, 4,000 years ago. <coughs> God enters into covenant with Noah on behalf of his family and by extension the whole human race. He has already said that he will not destroy the world again as he has done. That is, not by a flood. Now he fleshes out these words with a covenant. Look at verse 8 of chapter 9. Then God spoke to Noah and said to his sons with him, saying, As for me, behold, I will establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you. And with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, of all that go out of the ark, every beast of the earth. Thus I establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. So now for the first time in narrative, for the first time, God enters into covenant with man. This is a good point. This is a good place, isn't it? This is a good thing. Right? God has said to man, I'm going to enter into an agreement with you. I'm going to make a deal with you. And here's the deal. I'm not going to do this anymore. But this spiritual high quickly heads downhill. We read of Noah's drunkenness and his curse upon his son that followed him. And followed that, verse 19 to 27. We read of Noah's death in verse 28 of the same chapter. Of course he was going to die. Despite everything else, despite the deliverance from the flood, and despite covenant and promise, Noah's going to die, isn't he? Why is he going to die? Because he's the son of Adam. And by one man sin came into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men for all have sinned. For all his goodness and righteousness that saved him in the ark, Noah is still a sinner. And so he is going to die. After another genealogy in chapter 10 of Genesis and the unstated but observable passage of time, chapter 11 opens with the Tower of Babel narrative, which we just read. <clears throat> it's important for us to note that Noah's sin did not immediately plunge the world back into the ready-for-judgment category. The spiritual and moral state of the world that had existed in the last years before the flood. 
The Bible doesn't just, does not suggest that or say that. But the passage certainly states that by this time, perhaps two to three hundred years after the flood, the world's population had grown significantly and despite clear command from God was back to its disobedient ways. They stayed together in one place despite God commanding that they should scatter and replenish the earth. They built a city to entrench that rebellion and they built a tower whose top is in the heavens. Now, it's always a bad thing to disobey the law. It's a very bad thing to disobey God. It's a very dangerous thing to disobey God. Many commentators with reference to this tower suggest that this was an attempt to reach up into heaven where God was. But there's no evidence to support that conclusion. The simple reading is that they wanted to build a notable tower, perhaps taller than any structure that may have already been built. Whatever the motivation... God took it as a step too far in disobedience. We read in 5, But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, The people are one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Brethren, I want you to notice that verse, because we read these stories very quickly, especially those of us who've read the Bible most of our lives and are familiar with it and have heard it preached, and heard it taught, and heard it studied. But I want you to note what is said there. God says, this now they begin to do, that is, building the city and the tower, now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Isn't that a remarkable phrase? So God isn't angry with them building the city. God isn't upset with them building a tower. God says here, that the act of building the city and building the tower is a key that for them will open up their ability to do anything that they want to do. One act of rebellion is the turnkey for an unlimited amount of rebellion against God. Now that's a very important verse. One day we should spend some time looking at whether or not we are in an age where this they begin to do, and now nothing will be withheld from them that they desire to do in 2023. We should be thinking about that. God's response is not to destroy, but to confuse and scatter, which he does. We read in verse 8, So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased the building. Therefore the name is called Babel, because the Lord there confused their language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. Now I don't think it's pushing the analogy too far to say that this event marks the end of an era which began well, but a good start leads to disobedience and rebellion against God and its own last days. And the hand of God being evident upon them to stop them doing what they were doing. For God to say, you've got this far, I now have to stop you going any further. And so the Tower of Babel represents the last days of the post-flood era. What to next? <clears throat> well, to Abraham and his sons, I guess. Chapter 11 sets the scene for the beginning of a new era of relationship between God and man by documenting the first steps of Abraham away from Ur to the Promised Land. Chapter 12 looks back to that preparation with the famous words, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. And then the story of Abram continues on for chapter after chapter after chapter. As we have taught before, this marks a watershed moment in human history. As God starts the second of what I call the three streams of humanity. First the Gentiles, everyone else, until there was something different. Now the Gentiles continuing on, but a new stream of humanity, the sons of Abraham, the people of Israel, the Jews, become the second stream of humanity. And then at Pentecost, the church, again, a new stream of humanity, not based on race or religion, but based on faith and a spiritual relationship with God. And so now we have three streams of humanity in the world. We have the Gentiles, we have the Jews, and we have the church. We need to be careful when we're reading scripture to understand who is being addressed when God speaks. Still today, through the Old Testament, 
God speaks to Israel. But a lot of what he says to Israel is not what he is saying to the church. Israel is still bound by the law. We are freed from the law. Our happy condition. Jesus has bled and there is remission. Cursed by the law. Cursed by sin. Christ has redeemed us once for all. That great old hymn. <clears throat> so what do we note of the beginning of this new era? It started well. As God calls his man and he eventually obeys. He should have left everyone behind to begin with. But eventually he got the message. And loads him up with unbelievable and inconceivable promises in the correct sense of the word. Not the princess bride sense of the word. Okay, Inconceivable. And really they are. He will have a son, despite him already being 75 years old and his wife being 65 years old. That's how old they are when God makes the promise. You will have a son. Oh, really? <laughs> I'm old. <clears throat> he will have possession of a land which he has not yet seen and about which presumably he knows nothing. His son will start a great nation whose number will be as the stars of the heaven and as the sands of the seashore for multitude. He will not yet possess the land in his own right, only doing so after his family has endured 400 years in a land that is not theirs. That's the prophecy in, uh, in the covenant passage in Genesis chapter 15. And being delivered from the land by God's direct intervention. He will then return to the land and take possession of it. Has anyone in human history been the beneficiary of such amazing and far-reaching promises? What begins at Haran spans forward from then to 70 AD, more than 2,000 years. Through the events that are documenting of which make up the rest of the Old Testament, may we see any trace of the concept of last days in those 2,000 years. Why, yes, surely, not the least of which occurs in the very words of God's promises right at the beginning in the Genesis 15 passage. As he spreads out before his man the broad sweep of his and his posterity's history. Clearly, as I stated yet earlier, God is comfortable with the passage of time. He himself initiated at creation. He says to Abraham, you're not going to get this land yet. 15.13, he says to Abraham, know certainly that your descendants shall be strangers in a land that is not there and will serve them and they will afflict them 400 years. And also that nation of whom they serve, I will judge. Afterward, they will come out with great possessions. Now, all of that is documented in the Exodus. All of that happened exactly as God said in the Exodus. You remember when the children of Israel were leaving Egypt, they said to the people, can we borrow some of your gold? The people will take the lot, just get out of here. And Israel came out of Egypt, rich beyond its wildest dreams, and Egypt was impoverished, bankrupt, just for the sake of getting rid of the children of Israel. But then God says this, Now as for you, you, that is talking Abram personally, you shall go to your fathers in peace, you shall be buried in a good old age, but in the fourth generation they shall return here, what's the next phrase? For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. So God says, they're going to go down there, they're going to serve another nation and I will bring them out because in the meantime I'm waiting for the Amorites to get bad enough for me to judge them. And it's not finished yet. Are the last days of the Amorites? Is the conquest of the land under Joshua the last days of the Amorites? Looks like it to me. God is happy to wait for the right time to deliver his man into the land. The Amorites aren't yet bad enough for him to act, but surely he will, and he did. And there are several mini last days scenarios spread throughout these 2,000 years. Despite seeing God's hand of judgment on Egypt, when confronted with the prospect of entering the land, only just a year or so afterwards, enough of the people had so little faith to do so that God cursed the whole nation except those under 20 years of age and Joshua and Caleb and turned them around to march in the wilderness for 40 years until they all died. From the high point of the Exodus to zero at Kadesh Barnea. Kadesh Barnea is the last days of the Exodus generation, apart from those under 20 and Joshua and Caleb. <clears throat> After 300 plus years of disobedience and apostasy in the years of the judges, the nation again rose to great heights of both faith and power under Samuel and even under Saul. 
despite God being angry with that choice. You remember when the people said, oh, make us a king just like the other nations. And Samuel said, you don't want to do that. Yes, we do. So Samuel goes and says to God, listen, hear what these people want to do. They want to make a king. You know, you're their king. And God says, well, just give them what they want. They haven't rejected you. They've rejected me that I should not be king over them. So this nation said, we've had God as king, but now we want to have a human king. We want to have someone that we can look up to. What is your head and shoulders above all the other men with Saul? Better than that was to come with David, a man after God's own heart, defeating all of Israel's and God's enemies, preparing all the building materials required for the temple, and when he died, leaving the nation at its military and spiritual highest point since the Exodus. Here's Israel right on the mountaintop. David leaves them with the whole shooting match. Ready to go on from there to great things. Solomon, his son, inherited the most powerful kingdom on earth. Still, at this time, Israel is still more powerful than the resurgent Egypt. It is the greatest nation of the ancient world. He built Jehovah a glorious temple, perhaps one of the grandest buildings ever built. He prayed to God and worshipped him and led the people to do likewise. But listen to what happened in the last days of Solomon's reign. 1 Kings 11, 16, Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and did not fully follow the Lord as did his father David. Then Solomon built high places for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, on the hill that is east of Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the people of Ammon. And he did likewise for all his foreign wives who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. Astonishing. You know, it's, it's just like... You drive down the street sometime and you see someone do something and you think, why did they do that? <laughs> we were coming down this morning and a young pea platter in a tradie truck overtook us over an unbroken line at the crest of a hill around a long blind left-hand corner, doing about 30 kilometres an hour more than we were doing. And we both looked at each other and went, why do people do that sort of silly thing? <laughs> Solomon is the son of David. The powerful king, the man after the Lord's own heart. He marries all these women and says, I'll keep you happy, I'll build you a pagan temple next to the temple of Jehovah. Come on, Solomon. Get your act into gear. God has harsh words for his failed king in his last days. Look at verse 9. The Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned from the Lord God of Israel who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he did not keep what the Lord had commanded. What were the three great things that Dave, God said to Solomon he wasn't to do? He wasn't to heap up women, he wasn't to heap up horses, and he wasn't to heap up gold. And the story of Solomon tells us he had 700 wives and 300 concubines, he had more horses than the whole of the rest of Israel put together, and he had more gold than anyone in the whole of the known world. The three specific things that God said to Solomon don't do, Solomon deliberately went out and did. So God says, because the Lord said to Solomon, therefore, verse 11, the Lord said to Solomon, because you have done this and have not kept my covenant and my statutes which I commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days. Days, there, look at that. I will not do it in your days. For the sake of your father David, I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away the whole kingdom. I will give you one tribe for your son, for the sake of my servant David, and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. God both postpones the last days of Solomon's line and moderates his punishment. So, what happens next? Well, what should have been an orderly transition from Solomon to the next king, his son as had happened with David. The transition turns into a bloody and unedifying brawl between Rehoboam and Solomon's servant Jeroboam with a whole lot of women sitting on the sideline whining and bleating about, oh, he's all right, he's all right, you know, and it just turns into a, a really pathetic-looking Greek tragedy when it should have been a normal transition from the king to his son. It's a mess. By the time Rehoboam finally fought off the challenge and ascended the throne, the Solomon brand, indeed the David brand, had been severely, if not fatally, tarnished. People said it. David was great, and uh, Solomon was great, but boy, you know, what a mess in his last days. 
any hope that things might climb to glorious heights they had once occupied were soon dashed. Jeroboam mounts a coup and Rehoboam assisted him unwittingly by treating the people with contempt when he was trying to appear strong and in control. You remember what happened? The people come to Rehoboam and say, look, your father taxed us till there was nothing left. You know, back off the taxes a little bit and we'll serve you for the rest of your life. And Rehoboam said, well, let me go and ask some advice. So we go and ask the old counsellors of David and the old counsellors of David say, and the old counsellors of Solomon say, give them a break. You know, your father was hard on the people. So that's good advice, right? He goes and asks his empty-headed young mates, what do you think I should do? And his empty-headed young mate says, well, they had the money to pay, didn't they? Just ask for more. Turn the screws. So Rehoboam goes back to the people and says, well, if you think it was hard under Solomon, you wait and see what it's going to be like under me. And the people said, we don't have to put up with that. And Jeroboam and the ten tribes took off in a huff and went north and built a new city in Samaria and became a separate kingdom. And in just a moment of time, the glories of Solomon's kingdom crumbled to being one tribe, the tribe of Judah and the small tribe of Benjamin, a rump of what once had been a glorious nation. Awful. Should not have happened. Was wholly and totally avoidable. And the glory days of the United Kingdom evaporated in the last days of Solomon and his incredibly stupid and arrogant son. But worse was even yet to come. Unless you're a good student of the Old Testament, you may have missed this. 1 Kings chapter 14 verse 21. I'll read these to you and go and look at them later if you want to. And Rehoboam the son of Solomon reigned in Judah. Rehoboam was 41 years old when he became king. He reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. His mother's name was Nama, an Ammonites. Does that tell you anything? Does that tell you anything? Now Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord. And they provoked him to jealousy with their sins which they committed more than all that their fathers had done. Now Rehoboam is even stupider than his father. For they also built for themselves high places, sacred pillars, wooden images on every high hill and under every green tree. There were also perverted persons in the land. The AV, brother, the AV says there were sodomites in the land. The New King James translation softens that translation, sadly. It should have been left that way. They did according to the abomination of all the nations which the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. We're not even back to the level of the judges now, are we? Things are worse than they were during the days of the judges, before Samuel, before Saul, before Solomon. This is God's people we're talking about here. But wait! As the commercial says, there's more. There's more. Verse 25 of 1 Kings chapter 14. You may have missed this if you've read this passage through. You may have missed the significance of it. So let me expound it here for you. It happened in the fifth year of King Rehoboam that Shishak, the king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem. And he took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He took away everything. He also took away all the gold shields which Solomon had made. This verse describes in just a few words an earth-shattering truth. Israel as a nation here in this one single instant lost forever its independence and its sovereignty. From here to today Israel has been a vassal nation of somebody or other. From this day through to the days of the Babylonian captivity, Israel, at least the southern kingdom, was a vassal state of Egypt. The northern kingdom was also judged, we know that, with the Assyrians. Although in its own land, still, Israel was again enslaved to the very nation that God had once destroyed to set them free. The prophets chart these dark days. Although through the prophets hope was offered and forgiveness if the nation would repent 
and despite a few good kings trying to drag the nation out of its idolatry and its apostate mire, the last days came upon it with violence and judgment. The Chronicler tells us in 2 Chronicles 36, 15, And the Lord God of their fathers sent warning to them by his messengers, rising up early and sending them, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets, until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people, till there was no remedy. Aren't they chilling words? And so in 17 we read, Therefore he brought against them the king of the Chaldeans, who killed their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary, and had no compassion on young man or virgin or an aged or the weak. He gave them all into his hand. And all the articles from the house of God, great and small, the treasures of the house of the Lord, the treasures of the king and of his leaders, all these he took to Babylon. Then they burned the house of God, broke down the wall of Jerusalem, burned all its palaces with fire and destroyed all its precious possessions. This is the Babylonian captivity in 586 BC. And all those who escaped from the sword he carried away to Babylon, where they became servants to him and his sons until the rule of the king of Persia, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed its Sabbaths. For as long as it lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. What a miserable end to the kingdom which God had established with such greatness under Samuel and Saul and David. It's a long downhill path and it gets steeper as it gets towards 586 BC. There, by the time we get to 586 BC, God himself says, there is no remedy. And you remember... Jesus said to the Pharisees, you're the people who dug the tombs of the prophets. And you say, oh, if it had been like that in their day, we wouldn't have done that. Jesus said, you're the people who paint their graves. Now, you would have done it. Of course they would have done it. Do these fulfill the scenario to which we might ascribe the last days? Surely. Surely. As we see, however... Not only was the conqueror prophesied and his location prophesied, but also the exile's duration. It was, quote, to fulfill 70 years. Why are 70 years important in this context? Come on, you folks, you're well taught, you're Bible scholars. Why is, what's significant about 70 years in this captivity? The rest of the land. Yes. All right. They were to give the land rest every seven years. And for 490 years... They didn't give the land rest. And so God says it's going to get 70 years of rest all in one block. And you're not going to be here to farm the land, and we know now, to take precious resources and nutrients out of the soil until it won't grow very well. God said the land's going to have 70 years with you people not here to molest it. You've disobeyed my commandments. All through these miserable years, despite the inconsolable loss of the land, the people hoped for the days when they would be able to return. Psalm 137, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat down, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. For there those who carried us away captive asked of us a song. And those who plundered us requested mirth, saying, sing us some of the songs of Zion. And the response of the people is, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? And you can only imagine the misery of the people of Israel of thinking about what Solomon's time was like, David's time was like, the temple, the glory, the splendor, the power of Israel. And now they are sitting by the rivers in Babylon crying because the temple's been destroyed. And the people there are taunting them saying, sing us some of your religious songs. There's no temple there. God has forsaken you, but sing some of your religious songs. People can be cruel, can't they? <laughs> what a mean thing to say to them. People of faith like Daniel and his three friends and others yearn for the fulfillment of the 70-year promise. Jeremiah had prophesied this. Jeremiah 25, 12, we read, Then it will come to pass when 70 years are completed that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, says the Lord. 
and I will make it a perpetual desolation. And later in 29.10, thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you and cause you to return to this place. Every single person who was carried away in 586 BC knew or should have known that the prophets had said they were going to be there for a fixed period of time. And at the end of that period of time, God will bring judgment upon Babylon as he had upon them and restore them to the land. Daniel says in 9.2, In the first year of the reign of the king, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Babylon, of Jerusalem. Daniel reads the books, Daniel reads the prophecies, and Daniel says, ha, God has said this is only going to go for 70 years. And so it happened. Despite there still being no formal national repentance, God honored his promise, and Cyrus, the new Persian king, issued a decree for those who wanted to leave Babylon and return to the land to do so and to resume their national existence. Ezra tells us that around 50,000 people, including some from the earlier scattered northern tribes, came back in the first wave with Zerubbabel. The book of Ezra tells us that. This was surely vastly fewer than the number that had been captured, but Jewish tradition tells us that the Jews weren't slaves in Babylon and they may have been comfortable there and quite happy to stay and not return to their own land and perhaps the prospect of building a nation from scratch wasn't too palatable to some of them. A second decree was issued in Ezra's day but fewer than 2,000 men responded. You read the prophecy of Ezra, Ezra is despairing of this. Only 2,000 people want to come back to our land, to the land that God gave to Abraham. What's wrong with you people? Ezra says. A third group of exiles, unnumbered, returned in the days of Nehemiah and participated in the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. So the last days of the exile resulted in God keeping his word and bringing back some of the nation to Jerusalem, its city and its temple being restored. Sadly though, the return brought about a physical relocation of the people from Babylon to Jerusalem and its surrounds, but no great spiritual reform. Ezra had to deal with the people marrying amongst the inhabitants of the land, something which God had said back in the days of the law that they must not do, something which continued through the whole of the time of the judges, and something which continued right the way through the reign of Solomon, it would seem. Priests and Levites were the prime offenders in marrying pagan women when they had come back to the land. They had come back to rebuild the temple and to re-establish the work of Jehovah and the worship of Jehovah, but the very people who were supposed to be leading the worship were being disobedient to the commands of the law that they were supposed to be expounding. What chance have the people got if the religious leaders are off the rails? This was despite God's clear command not to do so. Nehemiah continued Ezra's reforms, elevated the status of the temple and true religion. A careful reading of Ezra and Nehemiah and consideration of Haggai, Zechariah and Malachi fleshes out this history and God responds. And against all the background of this, Israel has no king. Israel has no king. Then, not with another bang, but with a whimper, Israel again falls into the clutches of militarily powerful foes. First the Greeks, then the Romans. And racked with internal division and religion in disarray, we arrive in Jesus' time with a nation still, a vassal state in its own land, with a pagan Gentile, Herod, who was an Edomite, sitting on the throne of David. And religion in the hands of men of venal character, interested in only how it can be used to enslave the people of God. Do the days of Jesus qualify as the last days of the Babylonian restoration? In spades, they do. Now, we're not finished, not by a long shot. We've dealt, I hope, satisfactorily with the myth of the last days as the wording being used in the New Testament being a prophecy of all the days from Pentecost to the second coming. But what should we say 
of the last days with reference to Jesus' own days, his own life, his own ministry, his death, his resurrection and ascension. And what should we say of the last days in our days? Do Old Testament prophecies of restoration paint a different picture to that which you observed happening in Zerubbabel's and Ezra's and Nehemiah's day? What does Jesus himself say of the last days? His days. And specifically of the last days. What does Jesus say about that? Whose last days are they that he's talking about, if he does? And what do those words mean to us in our day? Now, I posed you a question at the end of last week, did I not? I said, we of all Christian generations have a finite reason to hope for the return of the Lord that no Christian generation has had since the day of Pentecost. What is that one fundamental difference between now and the days after the days of Pentecost? What's the one fundamental difference? Israel's a nation. Yes. Israel is now a nation in its land. In unbelief, I stress, and I hope to teach you here, that the restoration of Israel leading up to 1948 and the establishment under David Ben-Gurion of the current commercial state of Israel fulfills no Old Testament prophecy at all. But the fact of the matter is, for the Lord Jesus to come back for his church requires that there be a next event after that. What's the next event after the Lord coming back for his church, for his people? The rise of the Antichrist? Who will do what? Deceive the nation of Israel. Now, you can't deceive the nation of Israel if they're living in 6,000 other countries around the world. But you can do it very easily if they're living in one place and you know exactly where it is. And get them to sign up for them too. Okay, exactly. So this generation, since 1948, I was born in 1949, this generation has more reason to hope for the Lord to come back for us than any generation of the church has ever had. Because the next step is the deception of the nation of Israel by the Antichrist and the nation of Israel has to exist for that next step to happen. Yeah. So, we haven't finished by a long shot, have we? And today is what, the third week of August? We've got one week of August to go. How are we going to squeeze all that in? Well, the answer is we're not, because I'm also back here for the first and second Sunday of September. So, buckle up, all right? <laughs> Brethren, I want you to think about these things. All the stuff that I have read you this morning, all the stuff that I explained, it doesn't come out of here, it comes out of here. It comes out of the Scriptures. Read the Scriptures about these things. See what God is saying about these things. All that stuff is there. About Daniel, and about Abraham, and about... Hezra, Nehemiah, all those prophecies. Read those things. Understand what the word of God is saying. Let's be well taught people in these last days in which we live. And let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are first of all a God of patience. We're glad you're a God of patience, Lord, because you have to put up with us. And we try your patience something fierce a lot of the time. But you're good to us and you're gracious to us and you're patient with us. Like a father is patient with his children. Like a shepherd is patient with his sheep. So you are patient with us. And we thank you, Lord, for your patience. But we do look back in Scripture and see that your patience eventually can be exhausted. And you do and have to bring judgment. And we see these things very clearly as we chart through the paths that we have been down this morning. And that each one of these times end up in judgment and you issuing a call for the people to be obedient and to come back to you and to serve you honestly or else you will bring judgment. Father, we are convinced that we must be in the last days of the church age these days. And so we pray, Heavenly Father, that we might be good and godly and obedient, good students of your word, good communicators of your gospel, loving one another, as you have commanded us to do, and all the more until we see the day, as we see the day approaching. 
Bless us to this end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.